Good job, Krista. And she's not even the talented one out of that bunch. How about that? <laughs> No, we appreciate her singing. Uh, no, I think they've been after her for a while for her to come do that. So appreciate you being willing to do that. And uh, also, uh, Katie being so kind to donate her speaker to the cause. It was used for the service of the Lord. All right, now we are going to be in a few chapters, but how about this? Let's turn our Bibles to Numbers, and let's go to Numbers chapter... 16. Let's go ahead and go there. Because I do like our little tradition of standing in honor of reading God's Word and reading from a, a particular passage to get our sermon started. And let's go to Numbers chapter 16, as I'm turning there right now. And let's go ahead and read verses uh, 1 down to... Uh, let's just do verses 1 through 4. So Numbers chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. When you found the passage, let's stand in honor of reading God's Word. And we're going to get into our second sermon on this matter of misapplied, questioning doctrine derived from Bible stories. And the Word of the Lord says here in uh, Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Korhath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And, Moses, and when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Lord, we come to you today as we look at this story of Korah, his rebellion, and the true context behind it. Lord, may we rightly divide the word of truth and see uh, the true aspects of this matter and not make the mistake of trying to build a doctrine for us today on these historical and biblical events. And it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So today's sermon is talking about exploiting Korah. Now you may not be very familiar with this story. Maybe you have. However, I would say you are going to be familiar with the premise of this story, at least how it is commonly presented, how it is commonly taught. You are going to be familiar with some of the ideology and the principles behind it. And I want to kind of set the record straight for you this morning on this matter of Korah and how it has been twisted and manipulated by some preachers. Now, Numbers chapter 13 through 15, we would say are some low points for the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, last week we talked about Joshua being appointed, being appointed leader and his responsibility was to finally, finally after 40 years, bring Israel into the land of Canaan promised to them by God. We looked at their failure to follow through. Numbers chapter 13, God finally gets them to the borders of the land. Uh, Twelve spies are sent in, and all but Joshua and Caleb are quaking in their boots or their sandals, or were they barefoot? They probably had some kind of shoes on. And they said, we can't do it. The, the cities are fortified. The people are too great. There are giants in the land. There is absolutely no way that we can do it, despite God telling them, you absolutely can. And what we see here in uh, the close of chapter 13, Israel has had enough. They've been tired of being led out of Egypt on what seems to be a wild goose chase to them that is a hopeless situation they can't possibly win. And we get to Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. I need to turn on my mouse. Numbers chapter 14, verse... Uh, oh, there it is. I, I thought that I had a cool... Uh, symbol for you for our uh, sermon. Exploiting Korah. Everybody's thinking, my goodness, this really is going to be a hellfire brimstone sermon, ain't it? <laughs> now with that, Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night because they couldn't get into the land. They had no hope. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God that we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? 
And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. They said, is God just bringing us out here to die? It would be better for us to turn back and live in Egypt for than us to go on a suicide mission to try to take on these people in the land of Canaan. Let's appoint a new leader. Let's appoint a new captain. And let's go back to where we came from. So with that, the people led an uprising against Moses. Moses, the appointed uh, leader uh, by God for the nation of Israel. You're all familiar with that story. Moses being called out from the burning bush and being instructed, go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And Moses was given those instructions, that revelation. He was even given the ability to do some signs to prove that he had been sent by God. However, the people had had enough. They were they had given up hope. Moses and Aaron, they're not going to get the job done. We need new leaders. We're going to appoint a captain. They're going to lead us back. And uh, as a matter of fact, as you get down, they're ready to kill them in chapter 14. They're about to stone them, kill Moses, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb right then and there. And however... Uh, God uh, appears at the last minute in verse 10 to spare the lives of those four men, the four leaders. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Right then and there, God said, I'm ready to wipe Israel off the map. I'm just going to spare Moses, Caleb, uh, Joshua, and Aaron. I will make a new nation out of you. I will do away with the rest of them. Yet Moses intercedes as Lord, what will the other nations say? You brought them out of Egypt just to destroy them. Please uh, have a little bit of mercy. Please do not uh, destroy them, spare them for this time. And God does agree to do so. He had every right to bring out His judgment, but He showed mercy on the nation of Israel. And instead of uh, bringing His just wrath upon them, God gave them a sentence, which we are familiar with. After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year, ye shall bear your iniquities. Even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise." The breach of promise there is not that God broke His promise. It's that Israel failed to uphold their end of the bargain. God did everything in His power to fulfill His end. He gets them right there. He says, I'm going to give you victory. All you got to do is go in and fight and I'll be with you. And Israel says, uh, no, we don't think so. We don't have confidence. And then at the end of chapter 14, it's kind of too little too late. Probably thinking of some times my parents are here this morning whenever uh, they told me to do something and I put it off and I got in a lot of trouble and then all of a sudden I had a miraculous change of heart. And you know what, Mom? I will take out the trash instead of uh, rolling my eyes whenever you tell me to do so. And uh, she may have responded, too little, too late. Nothing's going to save you now. And uh, so with that, Israel decides they're going to try to... Uh, let's see, do I have the verse there? No, I go into number 16 from there. But uh, they, they try. It says... Uh, uh, go not up, because the Israel said, we're, okay, fine, all right, Lord, we take you seriously now, we know you mean business, we'll go take the land. We're going to march right in there and fight the Amalekites, we're going to take that land of Canaan. <coughs> Moses warned them, go not up, for the Lord is not among you. Now, you've already missed your chance. You were supposed to go in, God has already decreed, you will spend 40 years in the wilderness, you're not going to be able to get out of this one. Wherefore, uh, or uh, that ye be not smitten before your enemies, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Just remember, every time along the way Israel had a victory, God brought it for them. It was not that they could boast in themselves. God was the one providing the victories. Verse 44, But they presumed to go up unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Significant. Moses, their leader, and the ark of the covenant. Every time they went forth to battle, they brought the ark in front of them. If you remember the battle of Jericho, you had the priest carrying the ark around the city. Verse 45, Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill, and smote them, and discomfited them, even unto uh, Horma. I like the old King James language. Smote them. Whenever Jake uh, threw a toy at one of the babies, I smote him <laughs> out of love. Now, verse 15, in, uh, or chapter 15, uh, Israel learned their lesson. Okay, God, we're going to have to do things your way. We can't uh, disobey and then try to obey at the last minute. Uh, you're going to have your 
your way about this thing. God gives them instructions. And we're not going to go through chapter 15, but he, he basically says, I'm going to spell out for you exactly how you're going to be able to secure the land, how you're going to be successful, how you are to enter the land, what sacrifices you are to offer. He even gives instructions for those that are sojourning with them. As a matter of fact, Caleb was not a natural-born Israelite. He would travel along with them, but entered into that covenant. He was a, we could use the term proselyte, not that that, use, that term was used back in the Old Testament, but that's what he was. And so the sojourners, they had to commit to the covenants. They had to be circumcised and keep the law, observe the commandments, offer the sacrifices. And he gave them those, uh, those various instructions, sin regarding ignorance. If you sin due to ignorance, then there were sacrifices for you to offer. But if you sinned willfully, there was no sacrifice for you and you were to be stoned. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the end of chapter 15 records that a man was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. He were to do no work on the Sabbath day. He had just been instructed not to do any work on the Sabbath day, and he was stoned for his trouble. And people think Baptists are legalistic, huh? It was a different dispensation. There were rules, there were ordinances set forth by God. And praise be to God today, uh, I can't stand up here and tell you that a sin done willfully is not covered by the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, sins done out of ignorance, sins done intentionally. God has offered us not salvation by obedience to a law, but salvation by grace through faith. Now, I would hope that we are not striving to sin intentionally, but none of us are going to be pure as the driven snow. So therefore, thank goodness, we have the blood of Christ that covers all of our sins. Back in their day, there was not the blood of Christ providing that universal atonement for all people. There was a sacrificial system. You had the blood of bulls and goats that could sanctify the flesh for a time. But if you sinned again, you had to repeat the sacrifice. So in chapter 15, he lays all that out for them. And that was their step-by-step -step guide, how they were going to be in right standing with God. He was doing everything he needed to do to set Israel up to succeed and to take the land that was promised to them. Then you get to chapter 16, which we read, a certain Levite named Korah, he decides, I'm going to lead a revolt against Moses and Aaron. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you. Don't read that as, oh, Moses and Aaron, we need to relieve you of your burdens. You are uh, just having too much on your plate. I know you are up burning that midnight oil and you are just tired and you need help. No, what they're saying is, is you have taken too much authority upon yourselves. You have taken too much responsibility. It is not yours to have. They say, seeing all the congregation are holy. We're all the nation of Israel. We're all of God's chosen people. Why should you have the right to be the leaders over us? And the Lord is among them. Look, the Lord's among us. We have every bit of right to choose who we want to lead. It's almost kind of the idea of uh, somewhat of, to a degree of democracy. Let the people decide. God chose you to be the leader, at least so you say. We're saying let's let the people choose who they want to lead. Wherefore, then ye lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Who do you think you are, Moses and Aaron, to be lifting up yourselves before the whole congregation, to be the leaders, to decide, to make the decisions? Then verse 4, it says, And Moses fell on his face. That is not a Moses falling on his face, at least I'm speculating here, but I don't think it is. Moses falling on his face thinking, oh no, I'm in trouble. They're about to kill me. They're about to uh, overrun us. I think it was, oh my, we have rebelled against God and rebelled against God and now they're doing it again. We just got done having a revolt. How long is God going to continue to spare them and not wipe them out? That was Moses' concern. So, Moses falls on his face and is worried that God's going to carry out his wrath. In verses 5 and 7, Moses proposes a showdown to... Uh, there, there's him falling on his face, but verses 5 through 7 here. Uh, that should supposed to be verse 5. So this is what Moses' proposition is to him right here in Numbers chapter 16. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, and even he, him whom he hath chosen, he will cause to come near unto him. So basically Moses is saying, we're going to let God settle the matter. We're going to let God decide who the leader is, who's the appointed 
um, leader of the nation of Israel. Verse 6, This do, take, your, uh, take you censers, Korah and all his company. A censer was like a pan that would hold coal and you would burn incense on it. That's what a censer is. I don't know what some of the uh, modern translations may use there, but a censer is what that is. Verse 7, And put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. It's kind of interesting there. He kind of turns it around on them. Now, let's uh, talk about this matter of being a Levite. So, Korah was a Levite, but don't think that he was a priest. Not every Levite was a priest. Only Aaron and his sons were appointed to be priests. The other Levites had responsibilities. They would care for the temple. Now, I would argue it's very likely that by the time you get to the New Testament, the priests that were in charge were probably not the rightful Aaron... I don't know what the term to use, Arianite priests. <laughs> they were probably not sons of Aaron. By that point, it had been so politicized and corrupted that it was kind of a, uh, you, you pay for the position. But the sons of Aaron were to be the ones that were the priests. Korah was not a son of Aaron. He was, uh, says in verse 1, he was the son of somebody else. <laughs> so there were responsibilities that other Levites had as far as caring for the tabernacle, helping to move it and such things. But his position was not to be a priest. He was essentially saying, yeah, we can appoint our own priests. We don't have to follow what you and Moses or what you and Aaron are supposedly saying that God said. He also got these men to align with him that were of the tribe of Reuben. I think that if we investigate that matter... Reuben, if you look at the sons of Jacob, you know which order was born? Reuben was first. So maybe they're kind of trying to build a coalition here of the, maybe the well-to-do, the powerful. So Reuben, the firstborn, doesn't matter the rest, right? He's the firstborn of all the children of Jacob. Therefore, he's got the powerful men on his side, all the ones with sway. Furthermore, he even had 250 princes on his side. Now, this probably would have been well-to-do men. These may have been even some of the 70, basically the Sanhedrin that Moses had appointed to help him govern. So he had all the powerful men in his corner, and they are ganging up using all of the uh, tools at their disposal to go against Moses and Aaron. Now... This is the challenge right here. The Lord is going to choose. In verses 8 through 11, Moses, uh, uh, Moses continued to address Korah. Chapter, or verse 8, And Moses said unto Korah, Here I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to Himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? He said, listen, Corey, you've already been given an assignment by God. He's already appointed you to serve as a, uh, as, as a Levite, not a priest, but as a Levite to fulfill roles and obligations. It's an important role. Why are you being discontent with the role that God has given you? And then verse 10, And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? So you're not content, Korah, with what God has appointed you to do? Now you want to be a priest? Are you never going to be satisfied? Verse 11, For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord? And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? Why are you speaking against God's appointed leader? Aaron is the one that's been appointed as the high priest, not you, Korah. You don't have a right to do this. So then we get down to verses 18 through 24, and the uh, decision is about to be made. We get down to verse 18 here. Let's see if I have it. Verses 22 to 24, there you go. Verse 18 says these words, And they took every man his censer, and put fire in them, and laid incense thereon, and stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. Our oh, mind you, the tabernacle, it was kind of a forerunner of the temple. The tabernacle was a big tent, and that is where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the spirit, uh, the, the presence of the Lord resided, uh, sometimes referred to as the Shekinah glory of God. And that's where the priest would go and they would make intercession on behalf of the people. So the tabernacle was there. 
Moses, Aaron, his party, they have their censers, their coal, their fire, their incense. Then Korah and his party, they have their censers, their coal, their fire, their incense. And they are standing before the tent of the tabernacle. And God is going to decide. He is going to reveal who are, who's his chosen leader and who is not. Is it going to be Moses or is it going to be Korah? Will it be Aaron who's the high priest or will Korah set himself up as the high priest? And we read down here, getting into verse 19, And Korah gathered all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. And it would appear that the congregation had sided with Korah. They had already rebelled against Moses before. They had had enough of Moses being their leader. They thought he wasn't making the right decisions. He, they thought he didn't have their best interest in mind. And so they were all on Korah's side. Korah was going to liberate them from the misguided direction of Moses and Aaron and Joshua and Caleb. So far it almost kind of sounds like in the eyes of the Israelites that Korah sort of is a hero here, standing up to Moses and Aaron. We read further down, we get into verse 20, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. God gives His answer pretty clear. Get away from con the congregation of Israel, I'm about to wipe them out. I'm done with them. Verse 22, And they fell upon their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? This is their plea. Lord, Cor is the one that started it. Can you please not bear your wrath upon all of them? I, I will say, it, it almost sounds strange to us reading in this Old Testament that God would say, I'm going to do this, and then Moses intercedes and God says, okay, I'm not going to do it. Not to spoil the ending here, but God does not carry out His wrath upon the entire congregation of Israel. I would say that God in this is demonstrated to be somebody who does interact and engage with men. It is not that God is somehow a watchmaker who wound up His watch and is letting creation run its course without any regard. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, there's not maybe a similarity of that illustration with our day and age today. I am not someone who believes that if a tornado goes through blue, maybe shouldn't say that because tornadoes do go through blue sometimes, that it was God's divine will for that tornado to go through that path and take out this house. I think there are things that happen in this life. But when it comes to specific matters of dispensations and God dealing with especially the nation of Israel, God was not just uh, up there saying, I'm going to do exactly what I intend to do without any regard for man. God interacted with man. He allowed Adam to have the choice. Adam, you can either eat from the tree and you can receive the consequences that come with it, or you can abide in the garden and you can partake of all the fruit of it. Man was able to interact with God and make some decisions. And I would say that that shows a true act of mercy on God's behalf. Because if He was actually willing to do so, but refrain from it, that really is an act of mercy. Otherwise, this entire claim of step aside, get away from the congregation, I'm going to wipe them out, it was more of just a bluff on God's part. He never actually meant it. He was just kind of, I don't know, testing Moses and uh, giving Moses a little bit of a scare or something like that. No, I think that God, He can do something or he can decide that he wants to do something, but in his infinite uh, sovereignty, he can do what he wants. And a part of what he wants to do, and this will make Calvinists jump up and down and shout, no, no, no. In his infinite sovereignty, he can decide to let men make some decisions. I also believe that he has allowed men to look at the options of salvation, the gospel, consider the matter, and then believe it. I don't think that you are somehow a pre-programmed robot or puppet on a string that God controls every little thing you do. You absolutely have the ability, the faculty, to hear the gospel, believe it, and receive salvation. So in this same moment right here, I think God truly is. He's saying, Moses, I'm going to do this. And yet Moses intercedes. Verse 23, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah and Athan and Abiram. All right, congregation of Israel, get away from them, because I'm about to handle the matter. And so then, Moses is going to propose a sign for all the congregation to see. This is going to be the evidence to you whether or not God has chosen us to be their leader 
or for God to choose Korah to be their leader. And in verses uh, 29 and 30, we see these words right here. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. So it says if they just go on and live their lives and they die a normal death, die of old age, or snake bit, fall off a horse, whatever, that's proof that I've not been sent by God. But verse 30, But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. It's quite the claim. If they die a normal death, we weren't sent by God. But if the earth opens up and swallows them, that is your proof that I am your appointed leader, and you need to follow me. It's quite the challenge. Moses certainly had a lot of confidence if he was willing to make that claim. So the Lord is going to make His decision. Verse 31. And it came to pass, as He had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit. Sometimes we ask, who are the people that never died? You may get Enoch, you may get Elijah. Those are really going to be the only two, right? Enoch was not there for the Lord took him. And then Elijah was carried up into heaven on a chariot. But if we're going to be technical here, it says they went down alive into the pit. Be Korah and the men that were with him and their houses and all those with him. They never died. They were carried down into the pit. The earth opened up and swallowed them. And they perished from among the congregation. Verse 34, I can't blame them. And, uh, and, uh, and all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. Verse 35, And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. And uh, with that, that's the end of Korah and Korah's rebellion. Quite the dramatic story. This really bizarre event that maybe you haven't even heard of before, the earth opening up and swallowing all these men, fire coming down, consuming them, God making it very clear, no, Korah, you cannot read a, lead a rebellion, you cannot question, you cannot go against my appointed leaders, the men that I have chosen to lead this nation of Israel, to lead the congregation. You cannot defy Aaron's authority as the high priest. I have appointed him to be so, and you and your house are paying the price. You are going to be dragged down into the pits. So the people abandoned their attack on the authority of Moses. Now, it's quite the story. Let's talk about the misapplication. Korah's rebellion is a story of a person going up against God's appointed leader. God had appointed Moses to lead the nation of Israel. God appointed Aaron to be the high priest over the nation of Israel. And there have been a number of pastors and theologians that have used Korah as a, as a warning. As a, a story to uh, be cautionary, a cautionary tale about going against the men that God has chosen to lead. That congregations should not be going against their pastors. They should not be going against their ministers. I don't believe I have these written down here. I do apologize. This was... It was getting into the wee hours of the morning. The rebellion of Korah, this is a quote from Got Questions. If you just search uh, the story of Korah, what does Korah teach? Got Questions says this. The rebellion of Korah demonstrates the grim consequences of usurping the authority of God and all of those whom he has chosen to lead his people. Another quote from Got Questions. God calls whom he chooses and equips them for service. So, Korah demonstrates that you should not go against the authority of those that God has chosen to lead His people. 
Furthermore, God calls and chooses and equips those that He wants to lead. And then lastly, here's another quote from him. God's true leaders, the elders and pastors of the church who shepherd the flock with humility and care, have an accurate understanding of the Scriptures. So what is done here with the story of uh, Korah's rebellion? It is used to say... You do not question the authority of your pastor. He is God's divine appointed leader. And if you dare defy his authority, you are defying God himself. If the preacher says something that you disagree with, if the preacher does something that you don't think is right, how dare you rise up against God's chosen leader. He has been divinely given the wisdom and guidance and instruction for leading you as God's people. It's what a lot of them think. It's what a lot of them teach. And I'm here to tell you that that is not how you do Bible study. Because no pastor, no preacher is Moses. Moses was a very specific man in a very specific time given a very specific job. He had very specific revelation from God. God actually appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai. God has not physically appeared or spoken directly to with new revelation to any pastor or preacher. The Word of God, the revelation of God that the preacher has, is the same Word of God and revelation that you have, and it's this right here. I have no special insight, neither does any other pastor have any special insight. I do not have divine goggles that allow me to peer into the Bible and pull out the deep truths hidden in it. What we do is we roll up our sleeves, we study to show ourselves approved unto God. Amen. The same Holy Spirit that is within me is the same Holy Spirit that is within you. I do not have any special divine anointing power in order to teach the infallible Word that I present to you. The God, God's Word is infallible, and when I preach it correctly, then I get it right. But I am just a man. I am not infallible. You have every right to question the things I teach, you have every right to question the things I do. Now hopefully I'm doing things in such a way that you don't do that often. But the pastor, the preacher, is not a dictator, nor has he been given some divine authority. And if you dare question him, the earth will not swallow you up and consume you. I think so many of the issues that we have today is because pastors have set themselves up as Moses and have then treated any kind of, well, any lack of less than 100% devotion as defying God Himself. There have been many things that a preacher has said behind the pulpit that is not right. There have been times when preachers have not got it right whenever they're preaching a sermon. There have been things that they've done that aren't right, and just because they are called brother or preacher or pastor does not mean that they have all the answers and you have no right to study the Word of God for yourself and decide what you believe about it. So with that, the preacher should do his best. He should study the Word of God, but so should you. And we are all on the same, we're on the same level. So I think our churches need to realize that Honestly, there's probably more wisdom in the uh, congregation of people than there is in one man acting as some dictator over the congregation. And with that, thankfully the Word of the Lord is very clear on the matter that we have salvation by grace through faith in the completed work of Christ. Unlike Israel who had to keep the law, had to keep the commandments, if they sinned willfully then there was no sacrifice and they were cut off from the people. You and I, praise be to God, Christ has come, His perfect Son, who died on the cross and rose again, and it's through that work that you and I are saved. You can be saved by faith alone through His completed work. And let's uh, go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank You for this time that we had to uh, look at this story of Korah, Lord, and a, a word of caution trying to build a doctrine out of a historical event. Lord, preachers are just men. Pastors are just men. It doesn't matter uh, who they are, what church they pastored, even if they pastored the biggest Baptist church in the United States. They are, once again, at the end of the day, just simply a man. They can be right. They can be wrong. I pray that this congregation would know that they can study for themselves. They can read your word. They can investigate it. And they can determine what they believe to be true based upon what your word says, not because of what some preacher says. Lord, with that, we thank you so much for uh, the great 
offer of salvation we have through your Son. It's in His name that we pray. Amen.